how did you come to decide on uh, making a film about the life and work of Mike Edmonds? Well, I've known Mike for 20 plus years and um, essentially it was, um, we, we initially thought of doing a short film because we were between other projects and we thought, what can we do? And we were sort of thinking, well, what, this would be a good story, that'd be a good story. And then it suddenly occurred to me that, well, why don't we make a story about my friend, Mike? Um, because he's done a lot of cool, cool sounding stuff. Um, and um, we all thought, no, that, that sounds like a, why haven't we done this before in many respects? Um, and why have we waited till now? And we started off thinking, well, we've got probably 15, 20 minute short film here about Mike. Um, and we, as soon as we started talking on the first day of uh, interviewing and filming, um, it just became so immediately apparent that there was far, far more rich content than we'd even given him um, a credit for. Um, and I think that's partly because the reason we were surprised is because Mike is in himself such a humble guy and he doesn't boast about what he's done. Um, and he just he's just a normal guy we know we know we meet we talk to him and just chat about anything that you would normally do and because of that he doesn't say well I, I know Terry Gilliam or I know Michael Palin or I know Colin Firth and it was a surprise to us some of those relationships that came out and um, what was even more of a surprise is that not only did we get the great stories in the in the chats we had with him but when we then went to see if we could get Terry Gilliam and Michael Palin and Colin Firth to, to participate in the project, almost, I guess, thinking they would say no, they all said yes um, with gusto. And, um, and that gave us real confidence that we were telling the right story because he'd made an impact on their lives as much as he'd made an impact on ours. Um, you know, you've known Mike for a long time and, you know, he's such a prolific actor. I was wondering... What do you think is it about him and his personality that has allowed him to you know, be able to land so many projects and have the span of a career? I mean, I took the um, film over to Hot Springs Festival with Mike. And uh, so I got to spend a week with him. Uh, he's got a great sense of humour and he just sort of gets on with things, really. Um, and so I think that's the, the main thing you get from it. And... Uh, when he tells the story, you know, Simon's saying is you know, we, were, we were discovering things about him all the time. And, and of course, he tells, you know, we maybe did a few hours and then there'd be all these sort of loose ends. You go, well, let's fill this bit in and that bit. And the next thing you know, you, you sort of realise he'll, he'll name drop someone, not name drop, but just mention someone. And you go, oh, God, yes, of course he did that. <laughs> and it just became this sort of um, this beast, really, that it just kept spiraling you know and we ended up and and you know telling all the different aspects not just about his his film career but about his acting career and the fact that he's done theater and and radio you know and and as an actor uh, it's not about just wearing a, a costume so that's kind of what we yeah we discovered and uh yeah spent i you know i spent a bit of time with mike not as much as Simon, but certainly that his character his his um personality is is really upbeat and he's always got a, a line or a, a quip or, you know, it's just something to say off the back of something, you know, and, he's, and, um, and that's what makes him great and nice guy, you know. Can you explain that to us, Simon, again, about yeah, so, um, the significance yeah, exactly. so, of the title? Yeah, so, so we, obviously when you're looking create a film, you're trying to think, well, what can we tell, what can we t say what it is? And, um, under the radar really was was born of the idea that Mike's career has been really under the radar. It's, it's not necessarily on most people's awareness spectrums. And um, one of the things that um, was one of the triggers why I thought it would be a good story to tell is that um, he's often been mistaken for the late Kenny Baker, who was um, famously R two D two in the in the first uh, series of Star Wars. Um, and people thought, oh, I know you, you're Kenny Baker. And it, it, it's such a shame, really, that someone who had such, such a prolific um, career is being constantly mistaken for somebody else just because of their size. Um, and so, yeah, so under, I, under the radar works from that perspective. But also, Mike is literally short person, and therefore he's under the radar as well. So we felt it was quite a nice um, descriptor for the film. 
Olympia is a serious filmmaker who works on, directs and produces amazing films about contemporary artists. Um, I work on a lot of social justice films used to produce with Barbara Koppel many years um, and have directed my own features that have gone on to Netflix. And <laughs> Olympia and I were in an elevator on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, squeezed in with a crew with all of these C-stands and packed into this elevator and Olympia started giggling because it was just so funny that, you know, the elevator was doing this like one floor at a time. Kind of thing. <laughs> and uh, she said, I got the cutest little pet for my daughters, but I'm in love with it. I said, oh, where did you get it? She said, a guinea pig. I said, Ew. we just adopted a guinea pig. My son moved to London and we're empty nesters and we just adopted a guinea pig. So on a whim, we said, we ought to make a film. You know, the context of this is important too, because around the time that we were in this elevator together was like full, you know, Trump presidency, like the news was just so intensely negative. And I just remember finding such incredible solace in these animals, like just something that, that sort of lightened the load, you know, that the, the rest of the world felt like. So I think, you know, that was another, like Suzanne was saying, to bring joy with this subject, and also just for like personal therapy, you know, like I, I did not want to work on something really heavy and depressing. I wanted to work on something that felt manageable when the rest of the world just felt so kind of grim. Mm -hmm. There will be moments where they laugh and there will be moments when they cry and there'll be moments when they have empathy for the person and there'll be moments when they have empathy for the guinea pig. And so to have all of those emotions in one film um, that we set out to create that would bring joy, I think it adds a whole nother layer to what Guinea Pig Diaries offers. Marcus uh, follows a man who's been fighting uh, some mental illnesses, uh, mostly depression. And uh, it, fo it follows his story and how it affects his daily life, uh, his relationship with his family, his, uh, his work. Um, so it's his journey of how to kind of cope with this, although it's taking over. And, and not only that, but it's also a way of, of the family communicating with somebody who's dealing with it. So it's, it's written in a way where it uses raw, uh, re really uh, like raw language so that you can hopefully, if you watch it, kind of develop a sense of how to speak to people dealing with depression and mental health. In terms of like how you felt when you were writing the script or even like making the film, was it something that was helpful for you as a way of expressing yourself? And like, was it therapeutic or did you find it challenging at all? It wasn't therapeutic at first. Um, writing it was very difficult. Uh, filming it and seeing the characters go through a lot of stuff that I go through, uh, that I've been through. And not only that, but the actors themselves also were dealing with uh, a sort of, you know, depression as well. So just seeing everybody in that, it was, it was very, very heavy. Uh, editing it probably was the worst, um, just because sitting there in front of a computer watching the performances watch over and over and over again. Um, even the short film, when we when we had it at festivals and we went to a lot of them, and every time I sat there and watched this thing, it would tear me apart. Mm. Um, but dealing with talking like on Q and A's, let's say, or panels after the after the screening, or just doing interviews uh, has helped me because mm. the first couple of festivals with the short film, we didn't. I, I wasn't as vocal about it. I was still kind of holding back. Um, I mean, my mom didn't even know that I was dealing with mental health issues until we premiered the feature. And this was two years after the short. <laughs> she had no idea. I had to actually tell her because she was going to go into the premiere. And I knew that during the uh, Q&A, I was going to open up like I always do now. Um, so it, it has helped me just be very verbal, uh, like vocal about the entire, you know, the stigma and be vocal about what I personally am going through. I'm a villain. I've been in 75 movies. I've, oh, I've wow. died every single, I've been a James Bond villain, Mission Impossible, Harry Potter, yeah. Fantastic Beast. I've done all of that. Right. But, but I, my real love is period drama and human interest stories. And Give Them Wings is a true story. It's a true life story of Paul Hodgson. Paul Hodgson was diagnosed with childhood meningitis aged 10 months old. His parents were told he would never move or speak. Um, he's now 56 years old. 
He's an award-winning producer, author, and screenwriter, and it's his life story. And it's kind of my left foot meets Billy Elliot because he's severely disabled. He's in a wheelchair. He can't really use his hands. He's got a very bad speech impediment, so he stutters. But he's a genius. He's a very clever man, very funny man. The first time I met him, he goes, he goes, I can't move much, but I can hold a gin and tonic. And he's just very <laughs> funny. Yeah. And, and, and it's a really beautiful story of a lot of lows, a lot of highs, but it's you know about his struggle with the system, struggle being with, with being disabled. It's it stars a lady who plays his mother, Toya Wilcox. Toya was a huge pop star in the UK in the 80s and 90s, and she plays his mum. Uh, and the actor that we found to play Paul uh, is just incredible. So it's 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 you know it's a bit like my left foot, a bit like Billy Elliot. It's got this kind of very English, often quite depressing vibe mm -hmm. to it, but then it's got a big happy feel good ending. And it's a true story. It's been a very hard journey. Uh, I, I edited the film myself and I oh, luckily, wow. luckily after we finished directing, literally the day we finished, uh, I think it was November, uh, January the 19th, I think, and the day later COVID hit. Oh wow. And, I'm not, and, and, and you know, six weeks later we were all locked down. And I feel sorry for a lot of people, but I was lucky because I was always going to be editing the feature. So it, nothing changed for me. Right. I was just at home uh, editing the film. So right. and I finished it. I finished it about five, six weeks ago. So now I'm looking forward to the next movie. Were you making other films um, during this eight year period or were you totally? Oh, no, yeah, I, was doing, I mean, I was being I was being uh, Mission Impossible villain. Oh, right. and, um, I was doing it. But I'm just saying. It just took a long time to raise the money. Yes. Oh, I see. It's a low budget independent feature and, you know, several hundred thousand. So it's not, it's not pennies, but it's, you know, uh, a, a lot of development and finding the right cast. I like action movies, but what I really love is true life stories, real stories. Mm -hmm. I'm directing a period drama called Iron Gate, which is set in the shadow of the Crimean War for one of the biggest providers in the world. And it's two and a half million per episode. It's incredible. Uh, hopefully we're going to sign the contracts in the next uh, four to six weeks. But again, it's true life. It's true history. So it really interests me. Real life stories, you know, gangsters films and I, Star Wars and vampires. It's great fun. It's good entertainment, but it kind of goes over my head. Whereas yeah. a real story, a real story about a real man, that some things that really happened, it gets my heart. And, and that's my vocation is to, is to direct human right. interest stories, you know.